it is a really great honor, a great honor that I have to, uh, to introduce the Secretary General of the United Nations. He's fairly new in his job, just a few months, uh, really less than a year in this job. And uh, I think we can already, we've already seen what Ban Ki-moon can do. We've already seen that if you look very closely at what has gone on in Darfur, the effort to get a UN force there, the effort to deal with the, with the violence, you will see that Ban Ki-moon's very steady hand is behind that. And I think we're going to look at many, many different uh, examples in the world where Ban Ki-moon, with a very steady hand, a very persistent hand, is the person who is going to get this done. So let me now um, introduce, actually, the recipient of the Global Vision Award that he will uh, receiving tonight here at the Asia Society. Let me introduce the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. President Desai of Asia Society, Ambassador Richard Holbrook, Ambassador Christopher Hill, distinguished awardees, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ambassador Hill, uh, for your kind words and introduction. And I thank you for your very warm welcome. I'm greatly honored to receive this award uh, this evening this room seems to be very familiar to me uh, because when I was leaving, uh, while my residence was undergoing renovation, this room, in fact, used to be my family dining room. <laughs> With, uh, even though I have moved into a much better uh, place, uh, official residence of my uh, official residence, I had to uh, downsize my family dining room, in fact. <laughs> Tonight, uh, you are recognizing some remarkable uh, individuals. May I salute uh, Mr. Taniguchi on the beautiful new museum of uh, modern art. Uh, Sharam Naziri is a musical icon. I'm delighted that he will be performing with the Rumi Ensemble uh, this evening. I am pleased, too, uh, that you are honoring Neville Eastell of Coca-Cola, whom I have known while I was working together with him for Global Compact, promoting corporate responsibility worldwide. Congratulations to you all. For my part, it is simply an honor to be here on this special occasion. The Asia Society was founded 51 years ago to promote great understanding in America. Today, your society is a truly global institution, gaining ever more prominence as Asia emerges on the world's stage. You have offices in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Mumbai, and other world cities. It is only fitting that now you are opening an Asia center in Korea. And then my beloved soul takes its place among you. Ladies and gentlemen, when I decided to run for the post of the Secretary General of the United Nations, of course I sought out Asia Society to make my case. Now that I'm back, a year later, I can see many friends who helped for my candidature. In fact, I should not I should thank all of you for your help, but I want to reveal all the dialogues which I've had with you during the campaign process as somebody has done. But 
I'd like to acknowledge particularly one person, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, who prepared me for the bruising that was to come. If I may explain, introduce some episode. We had barely finished shaking hands when, in his trademark fashion, he gave me a shot right between the eyes. He asked me a question, very simple question. Mr. Van, do you know uh, what is Article 97 of the UN uh, Charter? Of course, I was not prepared at that time. He said that the, that says Secretary General is the Chief Administrative Officer. He said that you are the guy who is supposed to make the trains run, who should report to all the things to General Assembly. And there I was uh, thinking that the general in the title of the Secretary General. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, for that uh, cold shower. <laughs> that was the beginning of a hard and long period, campaign period, answering many such difficult questions, very in details, which have been posed to me by many countries, many friends. You helped me find the proper path, in fact. I thank you again for that and look forward to our continuing work on HIV AIDS. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the Asia Society enjoys a unique standing in our new era. We may or may not be witnessing the dawn of Asia-Pacific society. <clears throat> Asia-Pacific century. But no one can deny the importance of Asia's rise, nor the growing importance of institutions such as the Asian society. From my earliest days as a young diplomat, I, know, I knew that uh, this would be a place for dialogue, for discourse rather than declaration, engagement rather than confrontation. It is a place where reason and understanding Trump's sound bites and easy political rhetorics. As you know, this is my style as Secretary General. I believe in the power of diplomacy and engagement. When I was foreign minister, the government of the Republic of Korea advocated the doubt with the North. When some in the world called for sanctions or punitive action, South Korean government pushed for dialogue. That requires listening as well as speaking. It means sticking to principles, but also attempting to understand the other side, however irrational or intransigent it may sometimes appear. I quote my dear friend Ambassador Hill and his first principle of diplomacy, if I may quote, when something has happened, it has happened for a reason. You must do your best to understand that reason. This is what he told me while we were engaging in dialogue with him over North Korean nuclear issues. As Secretary General, I may not always deliver the pleasing sound bites. I'm seeking to understand the situation from all sides and pushing hard for concrete results. We are doing now that in Myanmar. As we speak, my special envoy, Mr. Ibrahim Kambari, is back in Yangon. I met him this weekend in Istanbul to discuss uh, this matter. That's to be the honest broker, the facilitator of over dialogue between government and opposition leaders particularly Madame Aung San Suu Kyi. <clears throat> I have said publicly to the Security Council, and I say again here this evening, <clears throat> it is time for Myanmar government to release all detained students and demonstrators to engage with the opposition and move toward a more democratic society. Above all, it is time for Myanmar to join the international community. This brand of dip diplomacy is not easy. There is a seldom applause 
offer no outward evidence of movement. It is a quiet, painstaking, behind-the-scene slug. You have to walk the phones, cajole world leaders to do this or that. It is a symphony, often not a very harmonious one, of a small steps that you hope will lead to something greater. You expect nothing. You can only keep trying, keep pushing. Maybe it works, maybe it may not. Then you try someone in a different way, aiming all the while for some small progress that makes the next step possible. We are at this point now in Darfur. No other issue has claimed more of my time or attention during the last 10 months. I have spent hundreds of behind the scene hours working with various parties to the conflict, the government of Sudan, African Union, rebel leaders, neighboring countries. Just even this afternoon, I had a very long and fruitful discussions with Mr. Salva Kiev, who is the first vice president of Southern Sudan. Meanwhile, we are pushing ahead with one of the most complex peacekeeping operations in our history. We are sponsoring very difficult peace negotiations in Libya. We are feeding and protecting hundreds of thousands of displaced people. And yet, all this is only the beginning. Beyond peacemaking and peacekeeping, there is a third and underappreciated layer to the conflict an immense crisis of resource management and economic development, starting with water. Dear friends, a peace agreement in Darfur is possible, but it can last only if we address all the causes of the conflict, developmental as well as political. We can hope to return more than two million refugees to their own homes. We can safeguard villages and help rebuild. But what to do about the essential dilemma? The fact that there is no longer enough water or land to live. Today, these resource issues are at the core of the UN's political and development work. More and more, they have become central to our strategies of conflict resolution and conflict prevention. That is why I am here. I am so pleased that Mr. Neville Estelle is being honored tonight in part for making water management and conservation Coca-Cola's number one issue. What Coca-Cola has pledged to do with its plant and operations, the international community needs to pursue on such a grand scale in Darfur. We must replenish Darfur's disappearing water and land resources. Our success can translate a peace agreement on paper into lasting peace on the ground. What if we fail? We fool nobody but ourselves in proclaiming empty ceasefire and hollow treaties. Ladies and gentlemen, as an Asian Secretary General, addressing this Asia society, I would like to close by sharing my own views on Asia's role in the world today and future. We Asians inhabit the world's largest continent. We are the world's biggest population and fastest growing economy. We have a rich history and an Asian culture. Yet, in international affairs, our role is far less than it could be. Asia's contribution to the United Nations, though significant, could be much greater. As a humanitarian assistance, I want to put this very politely, is less than generous. We are the only continent where regional integration and common markets have not taken hold. Let's see some uh, examples around the world. Latin Americans and North Americans 
dream of creating a free trade zones, a United States of the Americas. Europeans through European Union speak of building a United States of Europe, if I may call it. The African Union, now they speak about to become United States of Africa. Why no United States of Asia then? Then we have three new USAs. <laughs> Why is Africa, Asia different then? There are many reasons, history, cultural diversity, unresolved territorial and political disputes, lack of multilateral experience, and the predominance of one or two centers of power. But the main reason is that we have not tried. Asia does not do it itself justice. As an Asian Secretary General, I hope to see this change. I hope to see an Asian that is both better integrated and more internationally engaged. I expect particularly great things of my fellow Koreans, a remarkable people who have come into their own as the Asia Society recognizes with this new center. I hope to see Korea assume more responsibilities in the world, commensurate with this growing economic clout, especially in the area of development, one of the three pillars of the United Nations Charter. Korea should be more generous in its official development assistance. Koreans need to step up, speak out, and do more. The time is right. For this, we owe much to Ambassador Christopher Hill, a diplomat par excellence. He has done more than any other to make the six-party talks with North Korea a success. Ambassador Ambassador Hill, your persistence and skillful diplomacy and negotiations have brought us close, I believe, to resolving this last legacy of the Cold War. As a Korean, you can imagine my happiness, how happy I was sitting in the podium of the General Assembly. When General Assembly adopted by consensus a resolution, peace, security, and reunification on the Korean Peninsula, welcoming the historic South-North Summit meeting and urging international community to do more to help Koreans achieving this, realizing this dream. A peaceful, nuclear-free, united peninsula is no longer a pipe dream, thanks largely to your efforts. We can only imagine how difficult a diplomat diplomatic challenge it was. Coordinating all this within your own government, let alone with North Korea. The fact that we are dealing with the most sensitive security issues involving four big powers as well as two parties that directly concerned proves that multilateralism can work in Asia as elsewhere in the world. It is encouraging that North Korea has now begun disenabling their nuclear facilities, true to its word. If and when this process successfully concludes, we can foresee transforming this six-party process into a more permanent security mechanism, multilateral security mechanism in Northeast Asia. This is a promising beginning for Korea and for the course of peace and regional integration. Let us build on it. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here I am urging my fellow Asians to speak out when I have spoken so long already. I'm afraid I must leave for the airport now. I have to catch a plane to Buenos Aires this evening. My first stop on an echo fact-finding mission that will take me to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Antarctica and Amazon River. 
I want to see for myself the tone that climate change is taking on the Amazon rainforest and the polar ice cap. I want to see how these governments are responding. Among the many global challenges we face, I consider global warming to be the most critical. Once again, uh, thank you very much, Madam Desai and Ambassador Holbrook, Ambassador Hill, and distinguished guests, Owadis, and ladies and gentlemen. I hope you will enjoy and good night and best wishes to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for an extraordinary speech full of wisdom and specificity and a vision of your view of how your job will be conducted. So allow me to finish the story you told about our meeting at the Waldorf just after you had been chosen as Secretary General. It is true that I brought up the Charter. And I pointed out that in the Charter of the United Nations, the Secretary General is described simply as the Chief Administrative Officer of the United Nations. But I went on to say, what you make of the job is up to you, because there's no legislative or inherent power in it. And some Secretaries General have been strong, and some have been, how should I put it, weak. And I am so pleased to see as evidenced by this speech that Ban Ki-moon is fulfilling the vision of the job and its potential with all its complexities. I thank you so much, Mr. Secretary General, for joining us tonight.